Okay, let's have a word of prayer and we'll get going. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and we thank you for uh, your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that uh, we have a, a group of people here, Lord, that, uh, that think enough of this message to come out and listen and to study together, to fellowship together, to minister together, and uh, to honor their mothers today. We thank you for it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. The onus. Uh, that's your new word for the week. <laughs> The onus is on us, isn't it? It is. And so if somebody in this country is going to honor mothers, it's going to have to be us, isn't it? Now, Mother's Day is universally considered a holiday. Um, I guess you might want to call it that. Um, I, I, I think about this, and I, I, I wonder, you know, all the mothers that I'm familiar with, they need more than one day of honor a year. But this is kind of a celebratory honor, and it's also a way for companies to make money and sell flowers and candy. But I tell you what, they do need a day of honor, don't they? They need a day of rest is what they need, generally. And uh, hence, you can't get a reservation at the restaurants today because of all the people going to lunch. But I tell you what, uh, it doesn't matter. They're, they're going to get that honor nevertheless, and we're going to give it to them right now from the pulpit. The idea of honoring your parents is something that most children do not like. They don't care for it when they're younger. Uh, they don't like to give honor to anybody. That's just because they have a sin nature. They have to be taught this. And Paul teaches us this here so that we'll teach our children these things. And uh, turn in your Bibles, if you will, to uh, turn to Exodus chapter 20. And uh, we'll take a look at Exodus 20 at the same time. We're going to look at Ephesians chapter 6. I was just commenting, we have, four, we have four ladies in the group right now that are pregnant. And we have two that are not really in the assembly, but we also know of them that are also pregnant. Uh, Alexis Fulsang is pregnant. Uh, and also uh, uh, Rita Beckhorn, or I forget her married name now. I call her Beckhorn because that's what I know her as, but Rita spent a lot of time in this church and uh, she's also pregnant. Uh, her big thing was uh, when I get old enough to drive, I'm going to come to Suncoast. And uh, she got her driver's license. She started showing up every week and it was great to have her here. Uh, so uh, her and Clay don't live far from here, so hopefully we'll see them soon. I, uh, I enjoy uh, watching the, the progress with the young mothers because some of them know what's coming and some of them don't, right? <laughs> but you get an idea, don't you? <laughs> and, and you get the idea from the other ladies around you that can help you with those things. It's a good thing. So we're happy. Uh, whenever you have a congregation where people are having children and uh, you know, having more and more children all the time, that's a good thing. That, that means there's something going on that uh, gives them the opportunity to feel like that's something they want to do in life and this would be a good place and time to do it. Uh, a lot of people live in countries today where it's not a good time and place to have children and uh, they're thinking a lot about how they're going to save their children, especially if you're trying to get from Morocco to Spain right now. They, they, they just, it's just terrible what these people are having to go through in other parts of the world right now. The world's in an upheaval. Our world here is in an upheaval too. And uh, it's beginning to, to move on. I, I noticed, uh, many of you probably noticed on the news, the, the black mother who was out there in the street uh, pounding on her boy, chasing him down the street, pounding on him. And uh, any other time, they'd try to nail her for abuse. But, you know, he was, he was one of the few, and she was one of the few that were out there in the street. You didn't see a whole bunch of mothers out there chasing their sons. There was just one or two, maybe. But I'm sure a bunch of them were wondering where their sons were, and I'm sure a bunch of them knew where their sons were. However... The fact is that, uh, you know, some of these young men don't have fathers to raise them. And so what happens is their mother becomes their mother and their father, and, and they become very precious. After, after she caught him and, and, and got a hold of him and everything, they did an interview with both of them, and he was quite cordial and happy and funny about the whole thing. He was not sitting there like he was mad. He was happy to be on TV is what it was. <laughs> and he had some time on TV. So anyway, he was, you could tell him and his mom do have a good relationship, although he was running from her, and he did have a scowl on his face, and he kept looking at her like, why are you doing this? And I'm sure he didn't know he was on camera at the time. However, he's a national celebrity now, and, uh, you know, he got whooped right in front of everybody. However, that's a good thing. 
Uh, I don't know about you, about your memory. Uh, as you get older, you lose your memory a little bit, and uh, you have a little trouble in that area. We were playing uh, Rummy Cube last night, and uh, everybody thought, well, this guy can't do anything, and I beat him, all of them. So we had a good time and uh, with one hand. So uh, the, uh, the memory can come around if you need it. My first memory that I ever had is of my mom. I had a... a a lot of, I have a lot of memories that go way, way back. And uh, my first memory, uh, when I, I was in a crib, a baby bed, big baby bed, you know, you can stand up in it, got the rails up high. And I remember seeing her, and it's kind of funny, it's ironic, because when I, when I remember this, I don't remember anything past this, she was vacuuming. <laughs> now I'm in my room and I'm looking out the door like you'd look through that door right there. And she was in the hallway where the stairway was where you went downstairs. And she's vacuuming with this big, giant Kirby vacuum cleaner. You, you know those old things? And I was just standing there on the bed, like or standing in my bed, you know. And I was, tr I was wanting to get out. I was frustrated. I'm trying to get her attention, and she can't hear me because she's vacuuming. And she'd go by the door, and she'd wave at me, and I'm going, <laughs> you know, hey, get me out of here because I was up, and I was ready to get out, and I couldn't get out, you know. Now that might be a bad memory for some people, but it was a good memory for me. I'm glad to have any memory at my age, so I, I just I appreciate those. I have a lot of those kind of memories of her. And so a, as you begin to go back in your mind and you think about this, you know, about your mom and what kind of memories you have, you, you think about it and, and you, you, you re, this verse is a great verse. Look at Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1. He says, children, obey your parents in the Lord. And that's what it means. It means to obey them. It doesn't mean to talk back to them. It doesn't mean to run away from them. It doesn't mean to lie to them. It doesn't mean to do any of those things. It means to obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. And it is. It's a righteous thing. It's a righteous thing to do. Turn back to Exodus chapter 20 and take a look at it. Now, why does Paul quote the first commandment with a promise here? Well, he does it because the law is righteous. It is holy. It is just. It is good, it says. Paul tells you that the law is a righteous thing. It's not a bad thing. It's not wrong to believe in the law of Moses. It's wrong to put somebody under it if they're not under it. But the, the thing is, the law says this in the fifth commandment. He says in uh, Exodus chapter 19, did I tell you 20? Okay, Exodus 20. Yeah, verse 12 is what I'm looking for. Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Honor thy father and thy mother. And he tells you, if you go back to Ephesians chapter 6, he tells you, he quotes the thing in verse 3. He says that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. Now, is it an automatic promise that if you obey your parents that you, you get automatic longevity? No, he's not talking about some supernatural thing that you get that makes you live longer than you should normally. He's talking about that you may live to maturity and be an adult, that you listen to your parents, that you obey them. When, the, when you're running towards the street and, and, and you're, you're, you're going to run out into traffic and you're going to have that, that car whack you and possibly throw you 30 or 40 feet down the road, what do your parents do? Stop! They're not for negotiations, not for discussion. It means stop. Stop means stop. I trained my dog, and when I stopped, he would stop. When I'd go, he would go. He'd walk with his head right beside my knee, and whenever I could stop, he would just stop. I'd say, sit. He'd sit. Now, that took me a little while to get him to do that, but not very much effort, really. And, you know, when you, when you teach children these things and, and you do it, it's for their safety and it's for their, their upbringing, their learning. If you learn things from your parents, and back then they didn't have Google, so they were in trouble already, but they, they had to listen and learn so that they could continue on and get through life. Simple things, see? Basic things and things that had to be learned and things that had to be dealt with. But before you can get a child to, to stand up with you and walk with you and work with you, 
you've got to have him to sit down and be quiet and learn and listen. Teaching a, 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 a child to learn is one of the single most important things that you will ever do. And if you teach them to like learning, like my dog, if you teach the dog to like learning, he will enjoy it and the children will enjoy it as well. Now, the idea of what Paul's talking about here is honoring your parents and, he, and he's going back to the law of Moses because the law is good for this and it's designed to demonstrate by example that this particular situation is something God wants. It's in the, it's in the Ten Commandments. It's not a secondary law of a civil aspect or it's not in a law that has to do with religious aspects to Moses' uh, law. None of that. It is a moral law. It is a law that is designed for you to obey and to honor your parents, honor your father and mother, which is that first commandment with promise. And I believe mothers need to be honored. Children need to learn first how to trust and obey their parents God's way. And when they do that, then they can proceed further. Christian motherhood is sacred. It's holy. It's a good thing. And when you honor parents and you honor moms, like we're doing today, you're doing something that, well, today there's a lot of it going on today because it's lip service. It's, it's a holiday. It's expected. Now, I'm not saying that everybody that honors their mother today is not being sincere. I, I think they appreciate their moms. Many people do. And many people are sincere when they do these things. However, in the works that follow in their daily lives, this doesn't always occur, does it? It doesn't always get done that way. Christian motherhood uh, really is not to be degraded. Now, I'm not saying motherhood in general. I'm talking about Christian motherhood. Christian motherhood is not to be degraded. It's not to be berated as a low station in life. Like it's some kind of crime to have your wife pregnant and at home. I really, I really don't think that this country today understands the meaning of what it means to honor motherhood in general. Uh, today, you know, you see this going on and, and it's it's almost like women who stay home with their children or women who are what they consider to be homemakers are considered a lower class of society or more ignorant of, of what society's progressions are bringing. That the modern society is, is somehow ahead of all that. Well, you know, if you, if you start talking about these kinds of things and this issue comes up and society today is doing this because godly Christian women worldwide, they suffer as worldly women degrade and vilify them as ignorant. No account. I heard them called cookie bakers and homemakers, etc. Now they put them in that class because they think that there's a difference there or something wrong with that than being a professional or being whatever. You know, I'll tell you what people think about mothers, okay? They don't think nearly as highly of them as they ought to think. You say, well, what about women's rights? Well, what about them? I believe in women's rights. I believe that little girls in the womb have rights, don't you? I do. My little girl was in the womb. I was happy for her to come out. We didn't know what she was. We just, we didn't find any of that out ahead of time. But when she came out as a little girl, we were very excited. What about women that are unborn. Are they not also protected? Should they not be protected? 
I think that that is something that we overlook. We look at this and we say, well, yeah, women's rights. Women's ha women have the rights to do whatever they want to do with their own bodies and their own careers and whatever. Well, we see where that leads. Uh, turn back to Exodus with me, if you will. And you can see that God makes provision to take care of those who don't understand There's many other verses about this. Um, Exodus chapter 21. You read Jeremiah chapter 1, you'll see that God speaks to Jeremiah from the womb. Uh, you see Mary meeting Elizabeth, and what happens? The baby leaps for joy when the Messiah enters the room. And they're both in the womb at the time. One of them is the Messiah in Mary, and the other one is John the Baptist, and he leaps for joy. And th this ought to tell us something about how, how women should think about this whole idea of motherhood. Look at verse 22. He says, if men strive, 21-22, Exodus 21-22, if men strive and hurt a woman with child so that her fruit depart from her, and yet no mischief follow, he shall be surely punished. So what happens if her fruit shall pass from her? She loses the baby. Guys are tussling around, they, the woman gets knocked down, she's pregnant, and what happens? She goes into labor, she has the baby, or she loses the baby, okay? so that her fruit depart from her, and yet no mischief follow, he shall be surely punished according as the woman's husband will lay upon him. So let's say she has the baby early, and it lives, and everything's fine. She's far enough along that that happens. He can ask for compensation for that. Why? It's his child, and it was brought into the world in a very precarious way that was not necessary. Risk, in other words. Now, notice what happens. <clears throat> and he shall pay as the judges determine. And if any mischief follow, what happens? She loses the baby. What happens? It says, then thou shalt give life for life. Do you see what the price is for, for killing somebody that's in the womb? Even... When you look at it, even in this day and age, this would be unbelievable. It would say, well, no, it was an accident. The law of Moses says right here that it's a capital crime and it's to be treated no differently than any other capital crime. When you look at these things in the law of Moses, they look to be severe. I'm not looking at the severity of punishment versus being under the law and under grace, what I'm trying to show you is what God thinks about that life in the womb. There's no difference. He says, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burning for burning, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. You see, there are consequences for dealing with the unborn. Now today's day that we have here as Mother's Day we're in a situation to where if you look at the amount of children that were killed yesterday worldwide and you multiply that times the whole calendar year, do you know how many children they kill every year in this world? This is an estimate. This is really based on two-year-old numbers, but we're talking about 36 to 37 million children will never hear their mother's voice, or ever have a Mother's Day or a Father's Day, or ever see the light of day. 37, it's 36,500,000, and then, of course, you've got to account for the last two years. It, it is going up, by the way. It's not going down. They say it's going down. It's not. It goes down in some places, but it goes up in others. The fact is, 37 million a year, a year, that's not over a long period of time, that's a year. Now, ask yourself, 
when you look at those numbers and you look at that and you say, why do human beings do this? If you can't honor unborn children in the womb, how in the world are you going to honor your mother and your parents? And you're, when you're raised in a society where that is considered okay and fine, in so much that the government will even pay the bill, and in some cases, like in China, it is absolutely mandatory. Now, they're changing that over there a little bit. They're letting them have more than one child now and so forth because they got population problems. 60 years of population control has really messed that country up. And so now they've got all these people in this country, but they're all coming into the retirement age now at one time, just like we have here in this country with a, the big bubble of the baby boomers all coming into retirement at the same time. Uh, not a very good time for them to come into the retirement because there's not, they're not, some of them are not even able to retire now. But in China, their, their problem isn't with 310 million people total population. Their problem is with a million 400,000 or a, a hundred million or whatever they've got. I can't, it's one billion 400,000, I think, or something. But their, their population is growing like crazy. I mean, it's, it's just no matter what they do, but when you had a, a, for a long time under communist rule, when you had that second, when you got pregnant with that second child, they were demanded. It was, it was absolutely not an option. You have to get rid of it. And it's a sad thing. Today, women that have this done, it's a choice for them. But they're coerced. And when they're coerced, it means that they're coerced by satanic doctrine. It, this is not God teaching this, and if it's not God, who is it? It's, it's mankind. And what's going on is that this is something that's touted as a way out. It's a, a way to take care of the problem. Since when is being pregnant a problem? Not a problem. It's an opportunity. Some people, and I know some right now, they've been trying all their life to get pregnant, and they can't do it. You know, they sit back and look at this and go, we would just like to have one. And every day, worldwide, 100,000 kids are gone. And I ask myself, how is that a country that thinks highly of mothers? Well, I'll tell you what they're doing. They put it on the calendar in May, and then what they do is they, they, they turn it into something other than what God's Word says. In Genesis, God lays these things out, these four institutions. He begins with volition, the ability to make a choice, which he gives to all mankind. And then there's a marriage involved where God brings the woman to the man, and they have a marriage, and then they have a family. And those families grow up and keep growing and growing until there are nations form. And this is the formula for the human race. This is the blueprint of how God wants the human race to operate in a sin-cursed world. As a result, if you'll notice, that every single one of these things is under attack today. Talk to a Calvinist, he'll tell you, you don't have volition. Jason was talking about the Calvinist this morning and he had a laugh on it. The, 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 the issue of, of volition is absolutely true because people wouldn't be trying to change your mind if it wasn't. If you didn't have volition, then why are everybody trying to persuade you? See? Aren't they trying to persuade you? We're coming into an election year. Don't you think people are trying to persuade you to vote a certain way? They're trying to get you to make a choice, aren't they? Don't tell me man doesn't have a choice. We have a choice. And when you make that choice of marriage, it better be a good choice. Okay? That's important. And the, the idea of once you, once you get married, the idea of family is not a choice. That's a natural fruit of the marriage. That's the way it is. And these things matter. This, this whole idea of protecting our children, and believe me, I, I think today people go, they really work hard at trying to protect our young ones. But it, it's, and I, I mean that from the sense of the issue of child abuse, the issue of, of keeping them protected from uh, people on the street, stalkers and di different people. I mean, we're always trying to, you know, we got an amber alert, we got all these different things going on. And 
you know, you, you, everybody has to be aware about what their children are doing, right, all the time. And uh, yesterday at John's Pass, there was two kids got caught in the current were being carried out into the Gulf on the, on the, on the Gulf side of the John's Pass Bridge. And a guy ran down there and some people ran down there and saved those kids. And somebody was supposed to be watching them, but they went into the water, into the channel, and you don't do that there. You just don't get into the water on the channel side. There's signs. But what do kids that are six and seven years old know about signs? They don't know anything about it. So here they are. You know, they're, they're trying to keep their head above water. And luckily, somebody was watching them and said, those kids are drowning. And they were. Somebody has to be watching their kids. And, well, we take great pain in that. But, but you know, in all of that, you have to ask yourself, why do they feel that? Turn over to Romans chapter 1. Well, you say, Russ, it's natural. Absolutely it's natural. It's natural for saved people and well, as well as lost people. What does Paul say here? <clears throat> Look at Romans chapter 1. And look at verse 14. Paul says in verse 14, I am a debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. You say, well, what's that got to do with worrying about your kids? Well, because what Paul's saying there with the word debtor, it has to do with the same kind of thinking. Turn, to, turn over to 1 Thessalonians. Uh, chapter 2. It's the, it's the same kind of thinking that a mother feels for her child. And when you have a child, what happens? The onus is on you. The responsibility is on you. And, and you see that in this whole idea of going out and preaching the gospel, Paul says, I feel like a, a, a mother that has, has got this burden to take care of her child. Well, the reason he says it that way is that, that it's such a strong thing for him to take the gospel out because people are dying and going to hell. On the, on the, on the good news side of the, of the 37 million this year that are going to go to be with the Lord, they're going to go be with the Lord. They're not going to go anywhere else. So all of those that are killed prematurely, they're ours. They'll be there when we get there. That's how grace works. And Christ died for them. They're his, and they don't have a chance to make a choice. And God's just. So what's he going to do? You know, it, it's a sad thing to have somebody snuffed out in the womb like that. But at the same time, there is a brighter side. Look at 1 Thessalonians. Paul says this about his ministry among these heathen. Now, the ministry among those barbarians, as he calls them in Romans 1. The Greeks and the barbarians. The bond, the free. All the people that he went to. There were uneducated and there were educated people throughout the Gentile kingdoms. And when Paul went to these people, he had to learn their language. He had to learn their native tongue. That's why he says, I spoke in tongues more than you all. Because he had to learn these languages so that he could speak to these people. And when he met them and he brought them to Christ and they got saved, what happens? They begin to grow. Notice what he says in verse 2. He says, but even after that we had suffered before and were shamefully entreated, as you know, at Philippi, we were bold in our God to speak unto you, he's talking to the Thessalonians here, the gospel of God with much contention. Much, much contention. There, there are people trying to stop me from doing this. He says, for our exhortation was not of deceit, nor of uncleanness, nor in guile, but as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God which trieth our hearts. For neither at any time use we flattering words, as ye know, nor a cloak of covetousness, God is witness, nor of men sought we glory, neither of you, nor yet of others, when we might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ, but we were what? 
gentle among you, even as a nurse cherisheth her children. How is a person supposed to take care of children? Lovingly, like a nurse, right? So being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, because ye were dear unto us. For ye remember, brethren, our labor and travail. For laboring night and day, what's he doing here? He's working a day job. He's making tents. He's got to pay the bills. He's got travel expenses. He's got an entourage. They have to eat. They have to be lodged. They have to be taken care of. He says, laboring night and day. What's he doing at night? He's preaching. You can't work in the day building tents. You've got to be outside. You know, that's the way it was. He says, and he says, because we would not be chargeable unto any of you, we preached unto you the gospel of God. You see, after the people get saved, then comes the aftercare. After the baby is born, that's when the work begins. Now, the lady might say, well, there's a little bit of labor in between there somewhere. Yeah, there is. You've got to carry the baby around until the point where you don't want to carry it around, and then you've got to have it. And that's an expert. Uh, that requires an expert in itself just to be involved in that. Your husband's going to have to be an expert. <laughs> Coach. <laughs> And uh, you're going to have to have an expert doctor and somebody that knows how to deliver it because you've never done this before. And even, by the way, you wouldn't want to do it by yourself, but many women have, okay? However, when you have this opportunity and that baby comes, you kind of forget all the other part about the labor pains and the nine months of pregnancy and all that. What do you do? You're a mother now. And that baby is so completely and totally dependent upon you that it's a cling-on. And they do. They cling. And they want to be near you. And they want to be held. And they want to be fed. And they want to be changed. And then they want to be entertained. And then they want to laugh at you when you laugh at them. And then they begin to grow. And then they begin to see you. And then they begin to talk to you. And then they begin to walk around and have conversations with you. We watched Noah since the day he showed up here, walk around this building now. He's walking around here having conversations. And it's amazing how much of a little man he is already. And he's just, just getting ready to turn three, right? I mean, he's just three. Three. If they can, do, if they can turn into that at three, what's going to happen at 23? Well, they grow up. And then they take a little dip down, and then they grow some more. <laughs> you know, kids are great. And it's great for kids to have good moms, you know. I, I think that, uh, turn over to, to Titus chapter 2. M moms need to be raised. In other words, it's best to raise a child to be a mother, and a grace-believing mother at that, so that you don't have to teach them all that after they're married and have their children because that's the worst time to have to learn it. You know, it is a good time to learn it, but it's also a little hectic to be learning all that when you could already have it all already. So what do you do with your children? How do you break that chain? Well, you, you ask yourself, you know, what am I going to do with this baby? I would suggest you teach it. That would be the first thing. Take care of it and teach it. And you'll be teaching it everything from just, you know, the normal little stuff that goes on when you first begin all the way up to two when you're potty training. You know, there's a lot of teaching involved. And those things that you're teaching, they're not doctrinal issues yet, but you are laying the groundwork and you're laying the, the, the foundation of that relationship that's going to happen and that child trusts you and loves you and cares about you and is so excited about the things that you do together that they will listen to anything you tell them. And so what should you tell them? <laughs> Honor their parents. You should teach them that. And, and you should tell them about the Lord Jesus Christ. And you should bring them to a point where they can be accountable to God so that they can be saved. Accountability is a big issue with God. And a child isn't accountable when they're born. They're not accountable. 
they're not account able. They can't believe and understand the gospel yet because they don't even know what sin is. Even though they do it, it's not sin yet. It's just, you're just seeing the, the, the idea of what the, the old nature can do in sort of an innocent sort of way. You know, it's like, um, it's like you're playing with a pet and they scratch you. Well, they're not trying to scratch you. They just do it harmlessly. But, but there can come a time when you have a pet and if he's in the wrong mood and you're, you know, doing something stupid, you grab him by the ears, what happens? Grab a dog by the ears and see what happens. He's going to bite you, okay? And so, you know, you say he shouldn't bite the hand that feeds you. Well, maybe he doesn't trust you. I learned early on when you go to pet a dog and he does this, somebody's been beating on him, okay? There's trust involved. And you don't want to break that trust. And that trust and that relationship goes both directions. Look at chapter 2, verse 1. He says, But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine, that the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, in patience. The aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, like the gospel. This is grandma and grandpa right here. He says in verse 4 that they may teach the young women to be sober, serious, very serious, to love their husbands, to love their children. You say, well, that doesn't have to be taught. What does it say? that they may teach the younger women to love their children. <coughs> it seems to me almost an unheard of thing that a woman would run or walk away from children. And yet today in our society we see it all the time. Uh, mostly, most of the time it's the dad that, that, g that goes away and doesn't take care of the family, leaves, and, and sticks mom with the family. And that happens all the time. And Paul says men that do that are worse than unbelievers. They're worse than infidels. Even infidels don't do that. Okay? And so as you see it today, when the mother walks away from it, they had this thing about these, this, these famous trial in Texas there where the lady burned all of her children up. And, and you say, why do people do that? You know? Well, that's kind of an isolated thing. She's got a little sick in the head. She wasn't thinking properly. But what happens when a woman decides she's had enough of these kids and you take them to raise them and I'm going to walk away? Does a mother do that? Oh, they do it all the time. But isn't it a, doesn't it make you feel a little strange when that happens? Can you, can you not see it a little more logically when the father does it? I'm not condoning what the fathers do. But what I'm saying, isn't it more prevalent for the fathers to leave? Yes, it is. They don't have the onus. They don't have the responsibility. They don't have that, that debtor mentality that Paul's talking about in Romans 1. They don't have that need to be able to do whatever they have to do to raise those kids. You know, it, it's a sad thing, but the teaching that goes on here in Titus 2 is really, really important in the body of Christ so that we can raise young men and young women that can grow up and meet each other and, and by volition choose each other to marry and have a family and produce a larger family or families. He says, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, now this is the young mother. To be discreet, chaste, holy. That's what that's talking about. Pure. Keepers at home. Good. If you're going to stay at home with your children, where should you be if you're staying at home with your children? You should be at home. Not in somebody else's home trying to run their life. The reference there is to busybodies and people that are tattlers and running around gossiping and trying to run everybody else's life, okay? They don't have to leave their homes now. They can do it from Facebook or they can do it from the phone or they can do it from the iPad or whatever. However, it's the same thing. The principle's the same. 
Keepers at home mean if you're going to stay home with your kids and raise your kids, then stay home and raise them. Take care of them. And don't get out here doing other things. Obedient to their own husbands. I had a lady tell me one time that that verse is not in the Bible. I said, well, it might not be in your Bible, but it's in my Bible. I showed her the verse, and she said, yeah, it sure is. I said, yeah, it sure is. Obedient to their own husbands. What does that mean? It means they're supposed to do the same thing that Ephesians chapter 6, 1 and 2 says. Honor thy father and mother. But when your father gives you away in marriage, and that head passes you on to the next head, what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to honor that head. I had a man tell me recently, he's, we were having this discussion, a little bit about headship, and he said, oh, you can talk about headship all you want. But this guy's been married over 40 years to a woman that runs his life, okay? I mean, runs it, micromanages it, every detail. Children are grown, they're all gone now. And guess what? He's all there's left there to pick on now. You know what happens? You start thinking like you're the pup that just peed on the rug, and you're that way all your life around somebody. You got things juxtaposed. You've got things turned around. You, you're, not, you're not understanding the order of this. The order of this, according to the Apostle Paul, is God is the head of Christ, Christ is the head of the man, the man is the head of the woman. And I didn't write that. I didn't make it up either. The honor is to be to the husband through obedience. The honor is to be to the parents from the children. The honor from everybody is to be to God. Okay? And so these things need to be so. He says in verse 6, young men, he says, likewise exhort to be sober-minded. In all things showing thyself a pattern of good works. In doctrine showing uncorruptness in gravity sincerity, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. Same thing to the servants. He goes on through, he covers all members of the family here in all sectors of the local church in one short chapter. And what he's doing is he's laying the groundwork to show you that Grace, little girls that grow up in Grace, I've got a little girl across the street, I, I've known her since she was born, her name's Grace, little Gracie, and every time I see her, she just seems to be growing six inches, at, every time I see her, and she's running out there yesterday, she's driving around on her bicycle, and her brother's riding with her on the bicycle, and she's going up and down the sidewalk, and, and she stops, she goes, okay, no cars, and, she, and she's on the sidewalk, she, she's practicing, they're teaching her how to do this, and so she She's driving down, she stops at the driveway, and she says, okay, no cars, and then she goes across, and she just does, she's as cute as she can be. And she's so funny because watching her grow up, just, just as neighbors, watching her grow up has been a real joy, and just, just to see it as it happens. It's a privilege to see children grow up. It's not a bad thing. It's a great thing, but, but there needs to be honor. And when they split up, the parents split up here last year, and Dad left the home, and he, he's two blocks around the corner, okay? There's this, there's this need to see Dad, and Dad comes over and spends time with her. And he spends time with the boys, too. There's two boys in the house. And, and I tell you what, it's, 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 a, it's a fun thing to see families. It's a great thing to see families operating under grace, and operating in the Word of God and being able to demonstrate these things. And that's why I love to see parents when, they're, when their children are behaving themselves and they're honoring them, it's a great testimony. It's not just a testimony to the parents teaching their children the Word of God. It's, it's an example of the kids believing it. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 5. Notice what Paul says. So how many mothers can we have? Good question. <laughs> First Timothy chapter 5. Look at verse 1. He says, rebuke not an elder. Here's lessons on how to treat your elder. Rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as a what? Father. 
and the younger men as brethren. He's telling Timothy, this is how you teach the, teach the men and talk to the men in your assembly. He says the elder women as what? What does he tell Timothy to do with the elder women? To treat them as mothers <laughs> and the younger women as sisters with all purity. Do the TV preachers need to hear this verse? The scandal and the nonsense that goes on in, 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 in big hair Christianity where these people are running around with everybody else and marrying and marrying and remarrying and all these sort of things. And, and it's like, wait a minute. Should the, shouldn't the pastor understand how he's supposed to understand this particular issue? Should he demonstrate honor towards everybody in that assembly like he does his own mother and his own grandmother and his own sister? He should. Keep people out of trouble. They did. I think it's great. These things are not things you have to hunt for. They're all right here. It's fantastic, I think, because what you have is you have this layout that's so simple. And if you raise little girls to grow up and to be godly mothers and you raise little boys to grow up and be godly fathers, there's a really good chance if they meet and they make that choice, I choose you, you choose me, there could and there is a good possibility of having godly children out of that group. And godly generations can produce more godly generations and more godly generations and more godly generations. The chain can be broken with anybody in any social situation, but it takes Christ Jesus and that family to do it. I don't give motherhood a very good chance under Hinduism, Islam, Judaism, atheism, whatever it is they are. I don't give them much chance with motherhood. I don't give them much chance with fatherhood. They can have the children. They know how to do that. But they, they don't have the doctrine and they can't take the responsibility to raise them up and to do the things that they're supposed to do according to God's word if they're not saved and have the Holy Spirit and are learning the ministry of grace through Paul. This has been true for 2,000 years now. And since Paul got saved and the body of Christ got formed, we learn this is the way of edification and establishment so that sanctification can take place. Taking care of these things. People need to work as partners, don't they? Turn over to Acts chapter 18. When God created Eve from Adam, she was made and help meet for him, fit. So she's a helper, and she's a fitting helper. She's a perfect helper. She is absolutely perfect in every way. And she's perfectly designed for motherhood. She herself says it's about, she's the mother of all living. And that's what he names her, Eve, the mother of all living. And she is the perfect person. Is he supposed to get his doctrine from his wife? No. If you read Genesis 3, he says, because thou hast hearkened unto thy wife, you're in this mess. <laughs> and he doesn't take the headship and give it to the woman. He puts it on the man. And the problem is, it, what looks like a crown to some people ends up being a chain to others. Adam had to do what he had to do. Well, two men working together is one thing, but a man and a woman working together is a beautiful thing. That's what marriage helps you do. And notice in verse 25, well, 24, we better get the context, Acts 18, 24. Notice what happens here. And a certain Jew named Apollos, born in Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in the spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things knowing, uh, the, excuse me, the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. He's only current with John's program. He's preaching, repent and be baptized. Repent and be baptized. That's what he's doing. 
in verse 26, and he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, and whom he, uh, whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him unto them and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. They taught him the message of grace from Paul. Look at verse 27. And when he was disposed to pass into Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him, who, when he was come, helped them much. What did he do when they came to visit the people that they sent him to? He helped them much, which had believed through grace. He's not only a new believer himself coming into the, the gospel of grace and understanding the new program of grace, in understanding right division and establishment, all those things. But now he's teaching it. For he mightily convinced the Jews, and that publicly, showing the scriptures from the, by the scriptures that Jesus was Christ. He was the Messiah. He was the Christ. And that's what he did. Now, who are these two people, Priscilla and Aquila? Well, they're Paul's business partners. Turn over to Romans chapter 16. You'll see. They had a church in their home at Rome. They had a home base in Rome. And if you'll notice, as you just go down here and, and you see Christian love being just exemplified in Paul's last epistle, or last chapter of this epistle, he says, I commend unto you Phoebe, our sister, which is a servant of the church which is in, in at Centria. And he says, that ye receive her in the Lord as become a saint, <clears throat> and that ye assist her in whatsoever business she have need of you, for she hath been a sucker of many and of myself also. That's a helper. Somebody who ministers to you, like a nurse. Verse, thir verse 3, greet Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers in Christ Jesus, who have for my life laid down their own necks, unto whom not only I give thanks, but all the churches of the Gentiles. Wow, what an accolade. He says, likewise greet the church that is in their house. So not only did they travel with Paul and they made tents together with him, they, they had a home base at Rome where they had a local church going on and, and they're willing to give their life for the guy. You think they believed his message? I think so. I don't know what, what kind of family they had, if they had a family, but it looks to me that either if they had children, they were grown and, and out, or they may have never had kids. But I know one thing about them. They work together. And that's what it takes for families to work. When Paul says this in Ephesians 6, he says, honor thy parents. The assumption is there's going to be two. Okay? And that's the way it should be. There should be that godly example and that godly testimony. And I don't think you're going to find a, a greater testimony of godliness than you will of a Christian mother. She has something to offer. She brings something to the table. She brings something into the room. I think godly Christian mothers are a gift from God, don't you? Yeah. They deserve honor. They, reserve, they deserve respect. And they, they deserve that at the very peak of our society. And yet we got them way down here with lewd fellows of the baser sort. We got them way down at the bottom. Because we think that somehow, or some people think, somehow, that staying home and raising children is some sort of low-life, you know, thing to do. I don't think it is. Matter of fact, uh, my wife stayed home 10 years with my kids, and we had a great time doing that. I, I tell you, when I was going through that period in my life, uh, there were many, many days that going to work was not as exciting as it could have been. You know why? Because everything I had was at home. They didn't want to go to work. Sometimes I didn't go to work. Sometimes I took the day off and took time with my kids. And sometimes I couldn't. I can tell you this. It was always nice to know she was home with the kids. And uh, whether it was picking them up from school or taking them to school or whatever, we usually kind of work together on that. But, you know, the, the idea is that it's teamwork. And it, with two, you got a better chance of raising kids that are going to honor their parents. And if you get kids that can honor their parents, they'll teach their kids to honor them. They'll teach them, they'll raise them up in that. 
and that's why it's so important that we do it. It's absolutely essential to the fabric of our whole country right now. This country is coming apart at the seams because of the lack of understanding of these basic issues, and yet nobody knows what to do. No idea. And uh, it, it seems strange to me. If you ask me, is there, is there hope? Rick's got a good message. He's put it in the Grace Journal a few years, over the years now. Can America be saved? It can be. Anybody can be saved if they believe the Lord Jesus Christ, right? Can they turn this thing around and take it in a new direction? I doubt it. But you never know. I can tell you this. In my world, I'm not going to quit doing it. And if you're in your world, you don't want to quit doing it, then what's going to happen is you're going to get a few on board and you're going to get a few that might listen and you're going to affect a few somewhere along the line. I know camp coming up, we're going to have about 80 kids that are going to be affected by it. They're going to go home to a life that's completely different than it is at camp. I know that. They don't have this at home sometimes. We've got five kids coming from Evansville, and uh, I don't know the fifth one yet, but I know the four that came last year, and they're all, they're all come from real problem situations. And it's a sad thing. That, that pastor I mentioned a while ago, him and his wife, have spent the last several years helping to raise these kids, and these kids, they met them in the alley behind the church. They're urchins, okay, in that sense. They're, they're, they're just kids that live in a situation you can't believe it. It's terrible. And they've been abused. They've been messed with. They've been, it's terrible. And to see them last year come to camp and come to Florida for the first time, none of them have ever been out of the state, I don't think. They came out down here last year, and I'm telling you, they, they were so happy. One of them was the, the girl that wrote me that letter. I told you she wrote me four or five pages of questions. And, I mean, I looked at this, and I said, holy cow, look at this, man. She's got questions. And I sat down and answered all those questions for her and wrote her back by hand. And I, I had a great time doing it. You know why? Because she's hungry. And she's the oldest one out of the group, and it seems to have the most on the ball about looking out for everybody. She's kind of the mother of that for those three kids, kind of big sister kind of thing but now that she's they've all gotten saved and their whole attitude is completely different and they have they have become pariahs really in their own local neighborhood because they're hanging out at this church so much and that now they're getting these other kids to come and so they got a whole group of kids up there now that they didn't have before before those two retired people working together decided to take care of those kids when their parents were just could care less where they were that's what it takes. Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you today for your word, and we thank you for moms all over the world today. We thank you for our mothers and our fathers because there's such a need to, to remember them. And uh, as I said before, we, we, don't, uh, we don't have enough time you know, to honor them as we should, but we should honor them all the time and uh, think of them and, and, and care for them and take care of them in whatever way we can and to tell them that we appreciate what they've done. We thank you for it today. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Okay, well, thanks for coming today. It's good to see everybody.